Welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for uh, showing up here. This is our great opportunity to talk about things that uh, have everything to do with Japan and Japanese woodworking specifically. Uh, I think most of you know. Was anyone in my lecture on Friday? Is there any any of those people on Friday? Good, because some of the uh, slide presentation is the same as what I showed on Friday at Jan's class. And my expertise in Japanese architecture also includes traveling uh, over 60 times to Japan with groups of architects, American architects, of course, and having to translate what I was seeing in Japan uh, through their questions and being able to be in front of being able to be in front of uh, real experts, the Japanese uh, carpenters and architects who built and restored Japanese buildings. So it started out um, sort of as an apprenticeship in Japan in 1968. And then uh, by 1973, the World Craft Council decided to have a big meeting in Kyoto. And I was by that time fluent in Japanese, so I was able to lead the American uh, Wood uh, Group through Kyoto. And that's what started this whole process for me. At the same time, it was my third year of my apprenticeship, and what I was hoping to learn is how to build my own house. But as soon as I stepped into the Japanese world of architecture, I realized it was all about tools and how you handle tools and how um, the culture of the tool uh, framed the building. So uh, this is one of the buildings that we were working on it back in 1986, uh, a large temple. And after this picture was taken, a drop ceiling was put in, and the, 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 all of the framework disappeared a few days after this picture was taken with a nice, beautiful, polished wood ceiling. And the boards were this wide just one monolithic ceiling. So I, I felt like I was capturing something that was being lost in Japan, because there was not, at that time, an interest in showing the, the structure, the anatomy of the building. And I felt like that was 90% of what I was spending my time as an apprentice cutting out, was this wonderful uh, architecture. So. Also, about that same time, I, I heard about this storehouse that was in Nara, in the Nara Park, that had been established in 767 by the Emperor Shomu, because um, great gifts were brought from along the Persian um, side of the Silk Road and deposited in Japan at the opening of the Great Buddha Hall. And those were prized objects, so they built a traditional storehouse, which if you look closely at it, it looks very much like an American cabin, log cabin. There's horizontal logs. The difference is, in Japan, it's a very wet uh, summer, and the logs during the wet season would, would swell up and close, and a dry winter, but mostly wet in Japan, with, with over 60 inches of rain on average, materials like paper, uh, lacquer tend, tended to get too much moisture. Uh, lacquer would get bubbles underneath it. And so this type of storehouse is very for storing uh, precious objects long term. So the Shosuin is opened once a year, and about 50 objects are brought out from the thousands that were collected in the 7th century and displayed to, in the National Museum in Nara to the public. In 1992, I was leading a small group of architects through the museum collection, and I noticed some tools over in the corner. And these were carpentry tools, but more importantly, the measuring tools that were used during the construction of the Great Buddha Hall. And what's significant about those measuring tools was that the emperor and his carpenters, the Miya Daiku, the people who were licensed to build shrines and temples, established a uniform size. We all know about the French doing this in the 13th century with the foot, the king's 
foot. This was done six centuries earlier in Japan with the universal shaku, which was also happened to be exactly 12 inches. Well, it's just under 12 inches, 11 inches and three quarters. So it's about a quarter inch different from the American standard foot. So it made it very easy for me to convert things when I was in Japan. Uh, at least on the scale of, oh, that's a six foot, that's an eight foot, that's a 10 foot ceiling. And it was uh, convertible to the Japanese scale of, of the shaku. The shaku, which was all, actually came from China originally, uh, but the Chinese had 14 or 15 different lengths for the shaku. And each prefecture in China at the time used a different one. The Japanese right away said, no, we're doing one. And because it was the basis for taxes. The size and scale of a building was measured accurately with the same tool so that they could get their tax base off the, whether it was a temple or a private uh, home. So the shaku, once it was established, made it very easy for the carpenters to do very large projects. And the reason for that is because carpenters were scattered all over the country. And during the tumulus period, which was preceded this the great temple building time, they would just basically tell the whole population of an area to come to, to Nara and work on building these large earthen tombs. And they'd have 2,000, 3,000 people working day and night um, stacking, and they'd have other groups of people taking care of them. But that was the earlier period. The later period was very interesting. They figured it out it was much cheaper to have the people work at home in their own shops. But they needed something that was common. So when I say common, there's a module when you have a space of, of the shaku. So everyone knows about the Japanese temples and their amazing um, uh, bracketry that hold up these very large extended roofs. So they needed many, many brackets to build a large temple. There are over 4,500 brackets in the great Buddha Temple Hall. And those were built from the whole Western Japan. Basically, they, they um, asked the carpenters to produce one at home using a cut-out piece of washi paper that they could paste on the side of a piece of wood and cut the exact shape of this uh, bracket. And because they were all the same, coming from far and wide, they could be assembled in a single location by less than 300 carpenters working to assemble the, the building. So instead of th having to feed 3,000 people, they were reduced it to 300 people. It became, a, it became possible to build these great buildings. So the Great Buddha Hall, this uh, is the Buddha Hall. How many people have been to Nara and seen this, this incredible statue? It's 48 feet tall, which doesn't sound like it's that much, but the roof stands 15 feet above that, and that's the lower coffered roof, which you can see in this picture. And above that are the beams. So this is the outside of the same building. Looking at it from the side, you can see what I'm talking about by when I say brackets. It's the, that... The, that, um, that structure that holds everything together. And at the front, uh, the building has a very unique shape with that helmet roof that's right over the entry. That was not always there. This building dates back to the year 770, but it's been substantially rebuilt four times in that period. One time it burned almost to the ground. Two-thirds of the building burned down, and they were still able to salvage materials from the burn side and use those in the rebuilding of the final building. So part of what I'm talking about today is Japanese architecture, we think of it as ancient and having been there forever and never changing, but actually because Japan is situated on a very active seismic belt that surrounds the whole Pacific, we call the Rim of Fire. We're California, we're part of that Rim of Fire, but it's very um, important because the Japanese buildings were built and then they were tested by these events and they fell down. And the parts of them that broke 
were examined carefully by the carpenters. And so when they rebuilt, they built things differently. For one, one really important thing is the brackets were built very tightly, so they just barely fit together in the ancient times. And then after these earthquakes, they found that where the tightest brackets were, they actually sheared across the grain of the wood. So the whole bracket would be blown to pieces. The ones that were a little bit looser, the shock, while it was happening, was a series of vibrations or movements that were taken up in these thousands of joints and distributed through the building. So if you can imagine a shock wave coming from the southwest towards that building, it struck the corner and was absorbed by all of the friction from all of these parts. So when we talk about Japanese architecture, we're talking about a testing system that's very much like an engineered test to failure that we do modern buildings. And uh, nothing is holding that building down. There's no iron, there's no steel. It's weight of that humongous roof. If you look at that roof, that's an, you see that actually see people here. These are people. That's six feet tall. So you get an idea of the size. This is the largest wooden building in the world. And it's one third smaller than it was before it burned down in the year 870. This particular front of the building was the result of a rebuilding by Hideyoshi, uh, the great warlord, in the year uh, 1575. He rebuilt this uh, to, get, to get himself um, uh, appreciation by the people. So when you get up above that coffered ceiling, you begin to see the scale of some of these timbers. And Naoi-san, one of my great teachers, is sitting on the other end of this big beam, and you can see him down at the other end. That's the uh, scale of the timbers above that, those posts. Here's the building in what... It, yeah, I'll answer questions at the end. So this is the building that... It, what it looked like one-third larger in the year six, uh, 760. There's, in this area, there's now a big, uh, what we call helmet roof. But you can see the original with the three roofs stacked on top of each other. Much bigger structure. Here's a, uh, this is a model. And part of what I'm talking about is modeling, because modeling is really important in the restructuring of these buildings. They have to see where they're going and it's an easy way to cost out the, co the, the building. It may cost four or five, six thousand dollars to build a nice model, but then they can use it. They can bring it to the planners. They can bring it to the temple. They can bring it to the people who are funding it, which in many cases in Japan is the public. So these models are set out before the building is actually built with a little box to put some money in. And believe it or not, most of the funding for these large buildings came from the public, not from the tax system, not from the government, but from the individual people. The, the current roof that's on the existing building was replaced in 1988 through 1993. Every single tile was donated by an individual. And the trick was they allowed them to put their name on the back of that piece of tile. So they felt like, my name is immortalized in this building. So they, they, they paid the $120 per tile, uh, and that's how they funded the roof, the roof repair, which was $3 million, $4 million, without having to use public funds. Uh, in this little model, you can actually see the Buddha statues sitting there, so you get an idea of the scale of that 45-foot 40, 40, uh, tall. It's not even a third of the height of the building. There's the outside. It's quite a, a majestic building. I, there, there are over 400 temples in Nara Valley from the same period. Some of them as small as individual monks' cloister uh, where they sat and read sutras day and night, but some of them nearly as big as this great Buddha hall. So there's 400 buildings that still exist in that Yamato Valley. Here it is close up. You can see the people going in. This is the height of the eyes of the Buddha up there. This is the gate, which is actually located about a mile outside that inner temple. 
And everyone, every pilgrim, and pe people were considered pilgrims when they came to see the Buddha, because walking, circumambulating the building was a sense of physical cleansing of your spiritual body, so that you were, you were cleansing yourself by walking around that Buddha. This is a time when people couldn't read, when they believed in, and the same thing was happening basically in Catholic shrines in Europe at about the same time. So this outer gate is the first place that you have to cross, and it had these two great huge statues, wooden statues of Neo, the protector, the Buddhist protector, and they look like really angry men looking down at you, and they're 16 feet tall, and they're in, housed in this building. This building is actually older than the existing Great Buddha Hall, and it's built in a very unique way, and I'll show you the model and how, how it's easy to perceive this building. Very difficult to understand just walking up to it. I think there's a person here. It's very, um, there's the Great Buddha Hall right there in the background. So there's this gate, then there's another gate, and then there's the big Buddha. So getting closer, you start to see the scale. My wife is standing over here. This, by the way, this is about 6 in the morning. At, by 10 o'clock, there's 1,000 people under that same uh, structure. Um, I'm sorry that it's not quite clear, but you can start to see the incredible uh, bracketry that brings that roof. That roof overhang is 42 feet from the, from the center line of the outside of the building, 42 feet. And in order to carry that cantilever, the structure, you can really see it on this building, the structure to carry the load to the outside is internalized in the building, in the building frame which as an architect, it's really great to see that because you can see how they came to uh, structure these great roofs and hold these great volumes. I think the thing that's unique about Japanese architecture is uniformly long overhangs, long eaves. Uh, Western uh, architecture tends to uh, have the eave resting only on the rafter, and the rafter is not secondarily supported, whereas there's four or five supports to the rafter here. In fact, there's three sets of rafters, because no rafter is long enough to do that 40-foot over, overhang. And some of the rafters have different pitches as they go out. Um, you, can, you can see the structure. I took this picture again at 6 in the morning to get more contrast, but you can see there's a total of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight cantilevers. And each one goes back into the building. And looking at the inside of the building, this is straight, looking straight up 100 feet from the inside of the building. You can see how the loads were distributed back to the posts. The interesting thing about this particular gate was it wasn't designed by an architect or a builder. A monk traveled to Song Dynasty, China, and he had a piece of handmade paper and a black ink pen, and he started sketching a gate that he saw at the entrance to the Nanjing, which was the Western capital. And he came back, and the carpenter said, I think we can do that. And they built it. This is the model. Looking at it from modern sense, even from modern temple building, it's totally um, simple. It's very, very simple, very, but very straightforward. That's why I chose it to show uh, this, evolu this point of evolution in Japanese architecture. This building was built just five years before Genghis Khan tried to uh, invade Japan. So it's that very tumultuous period in, in uh, Asian history when the Mongolians were expanding into China, controlling most of China. This is another completely different building. This uh, roof system was built um, in 1820. It's, not, it's a modern building by Japanese standards, and it's a shrine. The interesting thing is it starts with a center core, the Honden, which is the third building back. If you look at it, it looks like there's three buildings. This is the Honden. This is where the kami, or gods, live, and it's always closed. It's never opened. One day of the year, they open the doors for three hours, and they invite the kami, or god, to come out 
and get into a palaquin that they carry up to the top of the mountain to sanctify the, the shrine for that year. This particular shrine is built to the god of paper making in Japan. And it's 1,500 years old, but this is just the most recent iteration built in 1820 and much more complicated than the one before. So th I took this picture to show how the evolution of architecture has become more um, complex over time. From a very simple building like we saw on that gate, where it's very straightforward, you can look up and see the whole guts of it, to something like this, where this is all, this is cedar bark roof. And the slivers of bark are three quarters of an inch long, six inches, three quarters of an inch wide, six inches long bundled together, clasped together, and nailed to the previous ones with a bamboo nail that's crafted on site. And th there's about 60,000 bamboo uh, connectors to make this one roof with all the different shapes. This particular roof and the re recent re restructuring was done by a great uh, supporter of Kezerokai, Naui Mut um, Naui-san uh, is a great carpenter. He's been to, to America five or six times teaching um, uh, us the simple parts of Japanese carpentry, but this is the kind of work that his, his group did. He took us to this place a couple of years ago. Oh, this outer shrine, this is the inner shrine. This outer shrine, this is where ceremonies are, are done, and it's that whole section of the roof, this section from here where that gabled roof comes over, was built so that people could perform libations and ceremonies for the gods. And they actually have young women dance, a special dance, in front of the shrine to invite the god that make the, to protect her of paper making, who's a, a female priestess, uh, invite her into the village to purify the paper making for that year. And this is done on the 3rd of May every year in this village. And then on the outside, that's where the, the average person can come and make an offering, make a prayer. So there's three sep this, this roof is for that. The second roof is for the ceremonial time when they're actually doing the dancing. And the inner main structured roof, this very complicated roof, is the closed building that's kept closed forever. And it's an empty room. There's nothing in it. Just cedar walls. So getting back to the models, this is back to, I'm slipping back 13 centuries. I'm now at uh, the year 590. This is the first buildings coming from Korea come into Japan. They were purely um, continental or from the Asian continent. They were had, there was no true Japanese architecture of this type at that time. So they were imported as a piece there were probably three or four experienced carpenters coming from the Silla dynasty in, Ch in Korea. Uh, this is during Tang, the Tang uh, period in China. They came over to teach the building of Buddhist buildings. And that was the first time that these were done. So this building is a model, 150th scale model of the Kondo, which is the, one of the three main buildings at uh, the oldest uh, temple in Nara. So it's a very, very uh, interesting time. And we would say it's very simple. The structure is, is almost Western. It's very, very simple. It has a straightforward posts, beams, cross beams, rafters. There's not that stacked roof system that you're going to see in a few later pictures. So just remember this one. This is a castle. Castles are built more like houses. Even though it has that same really complicated roof, this is Hikone Castle, which is a national treasure in Japan. The reason I love it is because of this. The inside of that castle has a, a one room with 52 cross beams stacked on top of each other in an impossible pattern. And that was done in the year about 1530. And I, I love this type of um, stacking beams. It's called the dancing beams. And I love this uh, type of structure. This is what we were talking about yesterday when we, when we were starting to uh, shape the beams. And all of these are actually shaped. They're not perfectly round. They're shaped in a, an octagon shape to get this cambium layer off and uh, make the wood um, much more resistant to bugs. 
Oh, this is a very simple building. This is one of my models that I did. Uh, actually, it was built by one of my apprentices five years ago. We took、uh, some trees that were dying on my property, the great big madrone trees, and we said, "How can we use these?" So the challenge was to these apprentices: you got 500 square feet, make a configuration of a 500 square foot building using the trees that are dying on this property, make a model in 1/20th scale. And all four of them made their own models. Toby's here; he made a model of this. His didn't win the competition, but anyway, we did that. And this is the finished building. And somebody asked me the other day, "How do you get those curved beams into the model? How did you make the model with the same curved beams?" And the answer is actually very modern. We take a, a growing branch. Of a, a cedar tree, exactly the scale at 1/20th scale that we want for the finished model, maybe this long. We cut it off green. We put it in a microwave for 50 seconds, and it starts to dry out. Lots of steam comes out of that thing. Then you take it out. You have about a minute. It's like a piece of noodle, and you pull it out, and you can shape it in exactly the shape you want. And then, and you've got this. Basis for a model, so we were able to duplicate the same tree part for four different apprentices to make their models from, and that was their invention. I'm just telling you, that's something that we didn't know in Japan 20 years ago when I was doing this. Here's another model that we did for a barn that we built in California. It's all using trying to use the round logs, and this is a, a performance space for musicians. But using the the same ads、uh, and broad axe techniques that we we see here today, how they could be put into a more modern setting. In this case, we cut down seven trees, and all the parts of the trees were used, including the outer bark, where we have a very sappy layer. And redwood is dark, dark color. The only the outside of the tree is the color of pine, but that that's all the outside bark of the redwood. That that ceiling, in there. The rafters are the heart of the tree. There's another one where we use that. This this span is 36 feet. That's about as big as you can use. So the tree diameter、uh, scale is quite large. Those are madrones set in the building that we we built.、Uh, this is a barn that was built for the University of California at Santa Cruz、uh, two years ago. It's 115 feet long. It's 11 identical、um, parts. That we call bents, tied together laterally by purlins. So this model、uh, served us very well because we were during the project we were able to make a grid pattern, saying okay A1 through D7. We're able to take all those parts from the model, put it down, make a story pole so that we could bring that story pole to the whole building, and basically build it off of one story pole. And we realized the story pole only had to be 22 feet long. Even though the building's 40, because we could turn it from side to side, and it, the story pole had four directions. And these are lateral story poles as well as vertical story poles. Same piece of four sides. You have lateral on two, vertical on two. <laughs> Here's looking at the model blown up 20 times, so you can see it. So we were able to talk to the architects and engineers about. How we were going to tie these pieces together. This was a building that was built by a Connecticut、uh, carpenter in、uh, 1851 in California. So that's right at the beginning of the gold rush. This is when there was a big influx of people from, but he had to sail all the way around the Horn to get there. There was only one box of tools that he brought, so it took a year to build this building. And it was all built with local material, redwood and Douglas fir. There's a, again, we use the models mo in a modern way with cameras to show where the architectural elements are, how the how they're being used. But another way is the model is given to the client. They take it up to their site. They orient it the way they want to build the the house, and they can see where the view sides are. They can see where the sunlight comes in. They can use it, in a, and they use their little Cameras in their telephone, so they can see actually at 120th scale. You're capable of actually photographing what you're going to see in the finished house. So that's another use of modeling. Here's、uh, 
our, our team working on putting that together. We had 60 carpenters uh, on that day, and we put it together in two days. And some people in the room were here. James was one of my main, main guys on that day. Here's the inside of it after the third day. Get, a, get an idea. There were 1,500 parts, not including the skip uh, sheathing on the top. But it's repetition. It's much simpler than the Japanese models. You saw those logs and the way that they were built. Now we're going back to Japan, 3,000 years. The original buildings were buried in the ground. So these posts are not sitting on stone. They're sitting six feet below on stone in the ground. They dug a big hole. They pounded with lifting weights, just like a, a modern uh, uh, pole driver does. And then they put a rock on the bottom of that. Then they put this pole, which this particular pole on the edge is 32 inch diameter post. So the floor is 12 feet off the ground. This is the main shrine of Ise. This is the center of the main shrine of Ise. Ye yellow cedar grown on one mountain. And somebody asked me this on Friday. Yes, they plant the trees knowing that 450 years later, they're going to use it for that shrine. Not only that, when they tear the shrine down, every 20 years, the whole building is taken down and rebuilt. So every generation of carpenters has a chance to learn the ancient style. And that style is more ancient, previous uh, photo, this style is more ancient than the Buddhist style, much more ancient. So this is the level that the carpenters were when Buddhism arrived. They were building things round and natural shapes with straw roofs. And they switched to the heavy tile structure from Central Asia. In about 70 years, they switched from this very organic, simple structures to a very complicated system. And somehow the carpenters kept pace with that and were able to innovate and change, make changes. And it, what I'm really trying to say is that Japanese carpentry is not set in one way. It's a constantly moving process that's been tested by earthquakes over the centuries. So what we're looking at when we say that's ancient Japan, many times is not ancient Japan. It's the attention to the detail of repairing their buildings on a regular The oldest building is now almost 1,500 years old. So you can, it's not one time, walk away. It's every, oh, 70 years, we've got to look at that roof. And we've got to learn that in this country, because if we really want to be sustainable, we have to sustain our buildings, our wooden buildings, for as long as it takes to grow a tree, at the very least. This is uh, another building that I worked on. This is a very traditional one uh, that we built in Japan. Um, with the, the walls are all woven bamboo with natural earth coverings. Um, uh, I just love this. This was another one where we covered the interior with uh, drop ceilings after it was built. This particular one is almost all uh, Japanese script, um, Kama Cypress obtusa, the Hinoki Cypress. Here's a building I was lucky enough to work on. Uh, it's the largest straw roof um, in Japan. It's in a place called Shurakawa Village. And I was invited to go up and help thatch that roof. So uh, learning that style, it's, I'm, I've shown you like three different styles. This thatching style actually is all tied together. There's no nails. It's tied together and woven. The inside of the building, there's a group of about 12 people lined up on these planks that are temporary. And on the outside, the straw, as it's being stacked, is sewn to the rafters. And the way it's sewn is you have an awl like a big needle with a hole in it. It's actually hardwood. It's cherry wood. And they put a hole in it, and then they put this rice uh, straw, rice rope straw, through that hole, and it has 12 meters hanging down uh, of straw. And you punch it through the one meter thick straw, and then pull it down. And then they, on the top, as you're pulling from the inside, they're pounding with these huge mallets, like the ones we saw out there. They're pounding that straw so that it's compacted and compacted and compacted. So there was 46 tons of straw that they had to put on that roof. Someone asked me, how long did it take to get all that straw? For that village, the whole 
area of the village that it covers, there's about a third of the village uh, mountainside that is called Satoyama, which means um, communal or uh, community forest. And that's where they grow the thatching, is in the community forest. It's not owned by anyone, but anyone who needs a straw roof uh, repair can take that straw and start to accumulate it for a roof. But they have to think three, four years in advance so that all the roofs aren't being replaced at once. The next question that someone asked me on Friday is, how long does that roof last? And it's, it's kind of sad because if you don't, don't have a fire going in an open pit underneath that roof, the pitch that comes up and gathers on the bottom of the straw roof is actually a, an insecticide and fungicide, a very effective fungicide. So it, it protects that roof for 50 years if you have the fire. And most of the village people have stopped that fire because it's, it's, um, it's very hard to gather the firewood. It's very hard to keep the flame going. All those things are, have died out, so it only lasts for 20 years, which is not sustainable takes too much straw to replace all the village roofs every 20 years. There's, there's 50,000 straw-roofed houses left in Japan. It's amazing there's that many straw-roofed houses. And that was the main uh, type of building up until about 1900. When people came from the countryside, they came from this warabuki or straw-roof culture. And that goes all the way back to that Shinto shrine because they, they tie the roofs together with, with straw on that Shinto shrine that I showed you that they build every 20 years. They do the same thing out in the country. So there was a knowledge that was spread out over the whole country on building knowledge. And it wasn't all in the techniques of, of chisels and uh, sharpened tools. A lot of it was folk knowledge, how to gather the pieces that were the cross beams. And a lot of the purlins are actually bamboo just harvested on the local Satoyama, that local community forest, brought in. This is the inside of the, the farmhouse. Uh, you see the tatami mats, and over here in the corner is an open pit. That's what I was talking about. That pit is kept alive in Shirakawa Village. It's one of the few places in Japan that you can see it, but it's a great experience to be there and have the people uh, tell you their, their family stories. It's just amazing. Jay, you've been there, right? Yeah. So here's what it looks like walking around in that village. It's, this was just the year before last. You can see the rice paddies getting ready to be planted. This is in May. And the mountains are really tall around there. This is a, we're in the clouds. It's the, the village is 4,000 feet high. So you're up in the village. It's like, uh, and the steepness of the roofs are because the amount of snow that they get. On average, the standing snow on average, is two meters deep in January. So people can get into the second floor when, they have it, when it's really sunny. So everyone has a gabled entrance that they can get in off the, off the floor level. And they tunnel through the snow. In some places, it's actually a tunnel where you walk through with flashlights in the daytime because the snow accumulation is so fast. It's on the Japan Sea. It just really accumulates quickly. Um, this is the complicated side of Japanese carpentry. This is the geometry necessary uh, and handed down family to family on how to build that wonderful curve on the outside of the Japanese temple. You know, we saw those gabled roofs that go way out. This is Naoi-san's great-grandfather's documentation on how to calculate that curve as you go out from the center of the building. And it's by just holding a framing square which is a sashigane, holding that framing square at a slightly different angle, a slightly different pitch angle as you move out. There's a curve that starts on the side and goes all the way up to that nice built curve. There's a second curve that you see on here that has to do with the roof pitch changing. It's not a standard 7 and 12 roof. It starts out as a, as a low pitched roof, but when you get up to the ridge, it increases in pitch to almost a 12 and 12 at the very top. And that's also calculated on this piece of paper, which you can go to, set your, set your um, framing square, go back, and uh, map it out on, on the frame. So here's a side view of that same thing with the rafters coming into that, that pitch angle and the different pitches in different places of the building. This is all Naoi-san's uh, heritage uh, 
paper. He's a, he's a temple carpenter, 15th generation temple carpenter. This is the god of uh, carpentry. This is the one that they brought out of the shrine in Takayama two years ago when they had the, the Kezrokai in Japan in Takayama. They, and this I've never seen before. They actually brought the god out. They had a special ceremony. They brought the god out and they put it in, in the, the, the hall where we were doing our, our uh, planning competition as a blessing for the group. It was pretty amazing. I don't think I was supposed to take a picture, but... Uh, here's more models. I, I, you know, I really don't want to spend your whole lunch doing this, but if I'm going to stop now, I can go on for hours. Obviously, I have a lot of information uh, the last 40 years. So if you guys have questions, great. In the, in the Todeji building, isn't there a, a special day when they open the door so the group is looking out the yes. door over the... Yeah, room? yeah. Oh, it's well, generally the dry season, the wet season, the moisture will just rush in there. So the dry season is in the winter, and the middle of the dry season is New Year's. So it's actually New Year's, but there's a double meaning because they want that building to dry out to naturally go through the changes of it. So that's when they allow that to happen. Yeah, those two windows at the top, yeah, are open. Any other questions? For, um, <coughs> In terms of the earthquake resistance, is it important to, for the roof to have the pitch that it does? Could, uh, you, could you use the same joinery but have a lower uh, roof? Roof mass is really important for the stability of a building. It sounds counterintuitive. We think the more weight you get up there, the less stable the building is going to be. In the Japanese logic, because the joinery is all capable of being moved vertically and out of its, like a dovetail, think of a dovetail joint. It's not held in any other way, and that's the main cap joint on all the perimeter of the building. You can lift it out if you had enough force. So the weight of the building and the structure of the roof all reinforce the concept of the building has enough shear among the joinery to hold together, and you actually have to have redundant beams, and the pitch of the roof is really important, but it's not the key thing, because in, depending on the part of Japan, the roof pitch is different. In the south, the average roof pitch is 4 and 12. In the north, the average roof pitch is 12 and 12. So it's very, very different. And it has to do with the snow loads, obviously, and other, other uh, more important factors. Uh, any other questions for Carl? Let's get some lunch. <laughs> okay, no, sorry. No, no. Yes. I was just wondering whether the, uh, the change in the pitch of the roof has a functional purpose, whether... Aesthetic. Okay. Aesthetic is aesthetic. functional. Functional is aesthetic. It has to do with the way that the, the building feels light. If you have a single pitch coming down, at least they have a, a word in Japanese called omoi. It feels heavy. Because those huge overhangs, if they also had a steep pitch, would feel very, very heavy, like it was directed at you below. And that, that lightness came from China originally, that, and actually from India, from the, the stupas in India. They started with those many curves, and the Japanese just had to figure out how do we make that curve? Because you see the original straw roof is a straight line. It's just very functional. So that's where the carpenters come in. And when we say miyadaiku, that's, a, that's an elevated carpenter, temple carpenter. And all we learn is how to make those curved roofs. And it's all about aesthetics. Um, it does have functions uh, for drainage and other things, but it's essentially for the aesthetics. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you.